Hello Mzanzi and welcome to episode 195 of Farmers Inside Track. I'm your host, Dornumdu. Can you believe it? We're already at 195. Five more episodes to 200. I'm so excited. <laughs> now in this edition, we share the 101 on cover crops, types, uses and benefits for new farmers and established farmers with three dynamic agronomists in Mzanzi. Food for Mzanzi's commercial journalist, Octavius Pandil, chats to Onele Mruzulwana, agronomist at Darakorp NPO based in Gauteng, Wafik Esop, agronomist and technical support and business developer at Afrinet, and Jovan Erasmus, an agronomist at Netafim. Over to you, Octavia. Thank you so much, Dawn. Onele, can you tell us a brief synopsis as to why farmers should plant with cover crops? We plant cover crops primarily to slow erosion. And it's not just to slow erosion, but to improve your soil health and fertility, while also enhancing your water availability or your water holding capacity. And you do all this and it also smothers the weeds. This is why we do it. And there are many, many, many types. It's very beneficial if done right. Wafik, can you share with us an example of cover crops, especially the time periods to grow it, and as well as the benefits thereof? So when you plant your cover crop, there is a time period where you want it to grow, which is usually about the same time when you plant the crop that you're actually going to harvest or just afterwards. You don't want it to overcompete, so you want to make sure that you plant the correct type of cover crop. Well, usually in these bags, these cover crop mixes that you apply. You also have this uh, concept of over sowing where you would sow the one and the other one. So the one might, for example, sprout when it's a bit warm in the summer. The other one sprout when it gets a bit cooler in autumn. So you have this constant growth. And what you've got to do, essentially, you've got to cut it down or work it into soil, till it in whatever means you have. And that can serve as a sort of a green manure. Now, the benefits that was brought forth with other colleagues, she made mention of various things, but there's many others. You get this thing in nature with Lumbo. It's essentially you trying to tame nature like you would tame a cat. Now you have a cat and that will be... There's a lot of similarities with a tiger because the tiger is more wild and the cat is now domesticated. So when you have plants, you domesticate them. But the wild part is always there. So when you have an open piece of land, it's never really open. There's always something there unless it's entirely compacted. So if your soil is healthy, something's going to grow and what you're going to have is weeds. So you don't always want the weeds because the weeds might carry aphids or other viruses and various type of cover crops. You get leguminous, non-leguminous. Leguminous will add a bit of nitrogen. They can break up the soil if it's compacted. There are ones like clover that would grow closer to the soil. Obviously, you can't grow it in certain types of soil that are more dry. But yeah, so essentially to cover that gap, many farmers do it. I've been to a farm recently, vineyards, and I'm certainly using wheat as a cover crop. Now, there it can work, but wheat, for example, won't work in citrus because you get the weevils that will hop on top of the wheat and then jump onto the citrus and eat from the fruit. You definitely don't want that to happen. So that's why it's always good to discuss with people like ourselves to find which cover crop mix and which cover crop is the correct one. And So it's the timing. And of course, you want to plant the type of cover crops very important. Some of them stay close against the ground, whereas others grow very high, very quickly. Like fetch, cowpea won't grow as quickly as something like rye or oats, which will grow upwards very quickly. So you want to make sure that you get the timing and the type of cover crops for you. Thank you, Wafik. I actually want to get back to you, Anele. Once the cover crops have reached maturity, what is the process thereafter, especially with incorporating it back into the soil? So the idea is to cut the cover crop as close to the soil as possible. And then you have two options from then onwards. So the first option is that you turn the plant material or the roots and you take advantage of the nutrients stored in all the plant. So you till it in into your soil. The second option is that you till in the whole plant, which includes your foliage as well as the roots into the soil. Thank you so much, Anele. Wafik, can you share with us any advice ensuring that farmers get the most out of this practice, as well as improving biodiversity? So when it comes to climate change, what you have is you get carbon-fixing microbes that you find within the soil. Now, which microbes are the various types? But generally, the more healthy the soil is, you want sufficient carbon, sufficient aeration, sufficient moisture and diversity on top of the soil. And of course, you have your insects, your nematodes, and obviously the soil food web that exists. Well, in the soil food web, you have the microbes, which will absorb, for example, carbon dioxide and other nitrogen from the atmosphere, which can work as a sort of a sponge and absorb a substantial amount of carbon from the atmosphere, which can reduce the effect of the greenhouse. And that will obviously get worked back into the soil, which become available to the farmer. The microbes that you would find within the soil would actually absorb carbon and nitrogen from the atmosphere and fix it, because they usually do that. But the more the greater the microbe diversity, the more absorption you would get. And if you keep them alive, 
and when you can keep them alive through moisture and feeding, and feeding would be obviously the carbon that you get from the cover crops. So the cover crops serve as a food source for the microbes in the soil. Then you keep them alive. Obviously, you're irrigating, hopefully. I mean, if one irrigates, even if it's rain-fed, you're still water falling. That will essentially keep the microbes alive. They will absorb more carbon. And that will reduce your carbon footprint of the farm. It's probably already low, but you can reduce it even further. It means that you'll have more carbon added to the soil and if you have a soil that has a lack of carbon, Carbon is very important. I'm not going to detail about that because that's going to be like three hours or so, but generally carbon would enhance the overall fertility of the soil. I've read recently that you could study 2017 says with cover crops comparing to a land with no cover crops, this was uh, apple orchard that had a 24% increase. And that was the only difference between the two orchards. They were right next to one another. And the one at the cover crop, the other did not. They used fetch as a cover crop, in this case, a common hairy fetch, and they had a 24% increase in the yield. And they were all of the same quality. It was class one. So using cover crops isn't something that should be looked at as a side thing and maybe I should try it and it's alternative. It is an alternative. It's actually, it's becoming mainstream, but it's something every farmer should look into. And finally, Chavon, what are the sustainable cover crops that can do well in drip irrigation, especially in the Western Cape? I'm not really an expert on cover crops. So asking me which one to plant, I generally don't know. Um, so I don't want to start blabbering and saying, try this, try that. But definitely so with drip irrigation and the water spreads from one point. So you will need something that is more drought resistant. And I'm based here in the north, so I'm not that familiar with all the regions in the Cape. But I know you guys are a winter rainfall climate. So finding something that that works with drip irrigation, because you're not going to have that rainfall that feeds your cover crops, that is quite a bit of a challenge. So... In the end of the day, I might say, if you disregard my previous comment about looking for something with a shallow root zone, that could be looking for something rather that with deeper root zone, which can be able to go and extract your water from the actual dripper zone and compete a little bit with your tree. And that could be an option for you. But asking me which one that is, I'm going to lie if I try to give you an answer. And then also, if, if you look at your spacing of your dripper lines, if you put them too close to the tree, you might not wet a bigger part of the surface area. So if you can look at moving them a little bit further away to give your, your distribution of the water a bit of a wider pattern, that could be something that could help some of the cover crops to grow on the outskirts of your wetted bulb that is created by the dripper. I hope that gives you a bit of a, a direction to run down, but asking me for the right one to plant, I'm going to have to lie. Thanks, Octavia. It's always a pleasure having you with us here on Farmers Inside Track. She's, of course, Food for Mzanzi's commercial journalist and absolutely amazing insights from Onele Nduzuluana, agronomist at Dara Corp NPO based in Gauteng, Wafi Gesop, agronomist and technical support and business developer at Afrinet, and Jovan Erasmus, an agronomist at Netafim. For more on this topic, go to www.foodformzanzi.co.za and go to our Farmers Inside Track channel. Next up, and before we let you go, we celebrate this week's soil sister, Olile Nkosi. She talks more about her journey getting into agriculture and how she's benefited from being part of the Corteva Woman Agripreneur 2022 program. This is a year-long blended development program at the Gordon Institute of Business Science Entrepreneurship Development Academy. I was born in Pumalanga, Fabachon. I started my primary at Lincoln Farm Primary School where we were staying. And then I did my secondary school at uh, Masita Kesselin Secondary School and also at Gamhola Secondary School. And then after that, I went to tertiary for electrical installation technical. So it was like a technical school. And then after that, I went to UNISA to do my electrical but even though I didn't finish my diploma, because I was already doing the practicals for the electrical. And then I decided to start my own business on the electrical part. Because where I did my practical for electrical, it was a black-owned company. And then I was having this skin that no woman, I can open my own company. And then when I opened the company, and then I started as a subcontractor to another ESCOM contractor here in Pumalanga. And then I was doing installation, and then it was a distribution. Thank you so much for joining us here, Holly Lemkosi. All the best with your farming operations and agribusiness. And that's a wrap from me, Don Numdu, Octavius Pandil, our producer Megan van der Fendt, and the rest of the Food from Zanzi team. Have an absolutely amazing week. Bye for now. Life in South Africa can be a lot. I mean, scroll through Twitter for a minute and tell me I'm wrong. Thank God for South Africans though, right? We're inspiring, and even on the bad days, we fight back with a smile. 
That's why I love food for Mzanzi so much. They're not ashamed to celebrate the ordinary unsung heroes who work every day to put food on our nation's tables. Go to foodformzanzi.co.za and never miss an inspiring story.